Thank you, Eve, for letting me presenting our work. I am a biologist, and I will, uh, I will not pretend to be anything else but a biologist. Still, I will talk about biological foundations, and then we produce a bionic MEMS, so I will spend quite some time, and there is material science there, at least. And then, um, did we succeed with our, our uh, bionic device, which is a question we usually ask in biomimetic uh, scene. Um, biomimetism is, is uh, not very en vogue in this country uh, in comparison to other European countries, but France seems to start slowly to do more and more. There was a few pioneers, uh, but there was one colloquium by um, a, a group very recent uh, it's interesting why they chose this animal, I don't know. Um, that's why. Uh, this slide is interesting because um, uh, the biomimetic scene using insect is, is uh, vibrant in Europe, and there is a group in Cambridge who approach the EU as well as the INR in France to try to build a whole network of uh, scientists, both in the US and in Europe, to work on insect-based biomimetic devices. And therefore, they uh, spotted a few excellency centers in, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, what you do see is Great Britain has, has a few, but mainly the German-speaking countries have a very long history of zoology, and also botany, actually. Uh, which is um, declining as well. And France has uh, uh, one or two groups, but not much more. Uh, sound perception in mosquito is very advanced, both uh, in terms of biology as well as in some biomimetic devices. Infrared perception in some insects, uh, spotting fires long, long, uh, at long distance is being studied in Bonn for decades, but also near retirement these days. And flow sensing used to be studied a lot with insects, both in Vienna, uh, this person went into retirement as well, and in my own group. Uh, one pioneer in this country is certainly uh, Nicola Franceschini, so I have a few slides about him because he really was pioneer and somewhat uh, neglected by his own country. He was, oh, he also spent like 15 years at the Max Planck Institute in Sevizen, which really produced many, many people thinking in these terms. And he was interested in how insects and flies in particular uh, can see movement. And uh, he designed uh, a retina. And from time to time, we see uh, his uh, devices and his group on TV shows or uh, in La Recherche. But in terms of uh, equipment and position at the CNRS, this did not pay out. He designed something which is unique, which was a microscope telescope, a strange item. Uh, with which he could go into the eye of a fly in a, in a single facet, and he could look into uh, uh, s single neurons. And these neurons are, uh, I think there is the name, DEM, um, are able to see how an object is uh, passing through the, um, the, uh, the, the facet. So uh, on the basis of his understanding, which lasted decades, he uh, designed several biomimetic devices. This one was one of the last one, Octave. This is uh, an eye made of a single um, neuron, so to say, or optical device. And it uh, can uh, measure flows, optical flow sensing without the major equipment you would find in an airplane. And it can really follow the terrain uh, very well. And um, ground speed, descendant speed, hate about ground, is being calculated through this very ingenious device. He got many prizes worldwide. Uh, and very recently in PNAS, you just don't see it in PNAS, his group and another group of APFL Lausanne uh, continued on the same line by producing um, artificial insect eyes. Insects are an amazing template, and certainly the largest community worldwide is looking at flapping flight. Uh, for surveillance, Al-Qaeda search, whatever. And you want small robots flying around, sitting on your table, taking a few pictures and flying uh, further. And this is a science paper which was uh, produced a few months ago by a group where they pretend to have um, insect robot in the meantime. Still attached with two wires and a big battery in the back you don't see on the picture. Now. 
uh, my work, and this is actually a very much joint work, you will see the picture of the people who work with me on these topics, is on the cricket and cockroaches hairs. These hairs are on these two, this looks like antennae, but they are not. This is the head with the antennae here. These are two cerci, uh, and these have many, many different kinds of hairs, in particular these long ones. These here are airflow sensing devices. Uh, you can have different length from 100 micron up to 2 millimeter long. And here you see what we call the base of the hair, which is called the socket in our uh, language. And I see something interesting here is that this hair uh, will move very little. This will come later on. And as soon as the air movement is too strong, it will hit the, the socket border. Once it hits the socket border, its measurement is, is basically done. It cannot go any further. Then the cuticula, which is very thin, will be somewhat deformed. And this deformation of the cuticula is picked up by another sensor, which works very differently. And in fact, what the animal does is not only putting together material to build one sensor, it's a system design where you have several sensors working together as a whole system by splitting the range of the forces. And I think that's very similar to what we heard today and, and we'll hear tomorrow about uh, hierarchy or system approach of materials. Here we have a system approach of different sensors working together and splitting the range of the dynamical range. Uh, spiders also, you, you know this picture, um, uh, spiders also have a hair measuring flow. So this is to get the prey. The prey is the cricket. The cricket tried to listen to the spider, so it's an arm race between predator and prey, both being very well equipped with all kinds of sensors. Now, why it is interesting for biomimetics? Because these cricket hairs are amazing. They measure displacement, which seems to be near the angstrom level, so very small displacement. They fire, that's, that's uh, better understood, they fire with 1,000 of the energy contained in a photon, and therefore they work at the thermal noise level. So they are, very little energy uh, is, is needed to fire them. And that's impressive in itself. And as a biologist in a team, uh, you ask why, what is so special about the cricket life or the cockroach's life to have such delicate equipment? And I will, I will spend quite some time explaining you the biology in order to get to this answer. Because when you do biomimetics, you are first struck by one number, say, or those two numbers. And then the more you work on the, on the topic, the more you understand that this is a multitask system. And then you wonder in which context it has been optimized. Uh, we also heard for the bone that the bone all of a sudden is a, is a reservoir for potassium or for calcium, which is yet another task. And then you wonder in the biology on which axis that did the biology optimize? Did it optimize on both, or how, how did it work? Uh, be, but before that, I want to show you what we did produce. And when I say we, I should say uh, this is an EU project. This is our two projects. This is the team of 20 universities in the Netherlands. These are MEMS people. Uh, we don't have MEMS uh, people in tour. And this is already quite a few years old in the meantime. The aspect ratio is not as good as the cricket hair. We cannot produce MEMS which have an aspect ratio like the crickets. Uh, but it's still 50 micron and it's half a uh, millimeter long. It sits on, on a plate. I will explain you how it works. In the background, you see we can combine those as well, like here. I will tell you why it is interesting. And this is the last generation, so it's a bit longer. So we pick up other frequencies with these kind of hairs. And because this second deck is thinner, we have less inertia, and that's interesting in terms of sensitivity. So now go back to the biology. So what is it optimized for? So we use a reverse engineering approach, which basically try to understand the selection forces by understanding at which frequency the hair is being optimized. And this is the maximal angle produced at one specific flow uh, amplitude. This is a long hair, one millimeter, a shorter hair, and you see the mode or the peak is being displaced to higher frequency, which makes a lot of sense because the hair is smaller, uh, but we also lose uh, quite some uh, radiance. There are two possible 
optimality criteria. One is the maximal displacement or velocity or, or acceleration. And the other one is more about how much energy do I need to get in my neurons uh, in order to fire, which is how much energy should I transmit through the hairs in the cell which is laying below. Now, the angular displacement of the hair can be seen as being a multiplication of three processes. One is, is the physical limit, which is really how air is moving. The other one is all about boundary layer flow, which is rather complex things. And then this is the pure mechanical response of the hair, including the socket, which is difficult to understand. The physical limit is, is rather simple. It says for the same, for a given energy content, uh, the higher the frequency, the smaller will be uh, the peak-to-peak -peak displacement, just because otherwise you would need more amplitude, uh, more yeah. energy. Um, I will not go into... Uh, this is split in 35 different equations. I will not show any of those, but this is the master equation, which is, which is an inverted pendulum. You will recognize inertia, um, stiffness, resistance, and the air resistance here. And then we will sometimes use um, um, ratio of these values. Now, the boundary layer flow, it's a, the higher the frequency, the shorter will be the boundary around this kind of antennae-like surface, and therefore the more the hair will, will feel. And, of course, a small hair will be lost in the boundary layer when the frequency is low. Sorry, the numbers just disappeared. This is low frequency. And uh, the higher, the longer the hair, the better it can hear. One being uh, no attenuation in this case. Depends how do you define. So a boundary layer acts as a high pass filter. It lets the high frequency go through. The mechanical response, again, as function of flow frequency, will be function of the um, damping ratio. You have here a peak frequency, which is the natural frequency, the frequency at which the hair listens best, which is 100 hertz. Below, you have the damping due to the socket internal structure. And higher, it's due to the inertia of the hair. Here, depending on the damping ratio, we have a more or less broad broadband filter around the natural frequency. Now, in order to understand if this is rather optimized for largest motion or impedance matching, we can build this small r, which is a ratio relating to the resistance in the socket versus the resistance in the air. If we have an r of 1, we have impedance matching. If we have an r of 0, we have the best movement, but uh, meaning that the damping in the socket is basically null compared to the damping in the air. Now, if we use the model, we have the mathematical model, and we change our values, that's what I'm doing here with the different colors. What I see, the largest possible motion is when R equals zero, but also I see that it's, oops, it's around the uh, natural frequency here. When I do the same for impedance matching, I get the same result. The largest energy transmission is when R equal 1. So I have conflict between these two uh, statements by the model, or I cannot choose between these two. But I see that bo in both cases, the natural frequency is where the system seems to be optimal, whatever I look at as optimization criteria. So we need to measure it. There is no way through the modeling only to know uh, w what it is, this R value. How do we measure this? That's where um, uh, uh, flow sensing of uh, fluid mechanics comes in. We use uh, particle image velocimetry, PIV. Um, this is a laser sheet of light, which will be produced by the laser you hardly see. It. It's the head of the laser. You put your cricket, this is the cricket here, with the two sursi, with the hairs, we just see it hardly. And this sheet of light will uh, it's very thin, it's very thin because we have a specific head here, will illuminate the, the cerci and the hairs, and we have some kind of smoke. It's not smoke, but I will, I will say it's smoke. And we can then, using a high-speed video camera, we can trace the air movement because the smoke moves as much as the air. Um, and so we can even go close to a single hair, what we see here, and if we have an oscillating flow like this, we can measure 
the airflow, um, the far field airflow and the movement of the hair tip. And then we can produce such maps, which are not models, it's, it's really um, measurements of, of the tiny topography on, on the surface, the hair and the different airflow velocities and directions. Uh, we became a specialist about uh, on this kind of microfluidics uh, aspect. This is uh, this antenna-like sursus. You would have hairs which go the whole way through. We just shave hairs. We have a technician who got very good at shaving hairs. Uh, left one socket here, but the hair would be as long as the whole. And then you, you have this laser. It's a pulse laser with two, two shots. And we can even be... Um, uh, closer, and um, well, there is no slip condition, so it means there is no movement here, which is the case if you look at this, does not move, and if you go further down, you see we are already far from the uh, surface, and the movement becomes oscillatory. Then we use um, uh, different models uh, for longitudinal flow and for transversal flow. This is meant to be the sursus on which you have hairs. Uh, this is rather complex math, in fact, uh, even though it's older. Um, and uh, we, we got pretty good uh, fit with the model. Uh, and this picture show you, again, the attenuation, which is null when it's, this number is 1. So it's really the physical limit cannot be better than this. And these are different hairs of crickets. And you see that it's hitting the optimal um, um, the physical limit at this kind of um, frequency, 100, 200 hertz. Um, the long hairs seems to be better off than the short hairs, like, like these ones. They are shorter if you look at the numbers. So, conclusion. Oh yeah, this is something I didn't show, but uh, there is a higher optimal frequency for shorter hairs. This is a broadband optimization. And R, unfortunately, is neither 1 or 0. It's in between. But it seems more likely that damping is stronger in the air than in the socket, even though it's not great uh, so far. That's our understanding. So we have a broadband. The natural frequency would be around here. And that's the way uh, we just uh, cartoon this hair. Now, nature could have done something very different could have done this. Nature in other places on the, of the same insect can produce thick hairs. This would have produced a larger mass and therefore a lower uh, natural frequency. It, it has chosen not to do so. Uh, nature could have also done the following. A stiff membrane at the base and therefore a higher natural frequency. It has chosen not to. And then it could have done both and produce a hair which listen at very specific frequency. And given that you have hairs of all kind of length, you could see it as, a, as an analog Fourier transform of some sort. And each hair would listen to one specific frequency. And the cricket would listen then to the whole world using the, his, his Fourier transform. Uh, not so. Uh, nature really optimizes hair at, around their natural frequency. That seems to be always true. But they want to be broadband. Now, why? But before? We go into why. We have to accept the fact that hairs and spiders are very hairy, that we all know. And they are so dense that they probably interact among each other hydrodynamically. And how does this hydrodynamic interaction, which is called uh, viscous uh, interactions, because it's viscous flow at, at that size and, and flow uh, intensity, uh, how does it influence the uh, sensitivity of the hairs? Now, this uh, was un we were unable to study this on the live animal because every single hair had its own plane of, of preference. It will move in one very specific direction. It can move in all directions, but there is one preferential plane. And you cannot find two hairs like these ones which move in the same fashion uh, in the same plane. And that we wanted to understand uh, first before getting to the more complex. You see, uh, this one is moving this way. I mean, it's, it's just impossible to study. So we use our MEMS hairs, which were designed after the cricket hair, to understand this viscous coupling. And b before we go into viscous coupling, we, we need to understand flow perturbation by single hairs. So you have, this is the MEMS hair. 
These are, by, by the way, measurements, right? It's not just a finite element modeling. These are true measurements. We change the frequency of the sound. And uh, this is a flow perturbation, which is dimensional distance, one unit being uh, the diameter of the hair. So it's diameters. And what you see both ways is, and that makes a lot of sense, is that a high frequency, the flow perturbation will not last very long. It's just near the hair. At, at low frequency, the impact is felt much further beyond. Now we then produce MEMS, tandem MEMS, oscillating in the same plane. I mean, they have no preferred uh, direction. And we could, we could produce these kind of things, moving the distance between hairs. And we have our uh, laser sheet just crossing the flow and we can produce such maps. And this is the results. Now, frequency goes higher and higher on the x-axis, and on the y-axis you have hairs very near to each other here, and very far apart from each other. And if you look at the whole picture here, you see that two hairs which are near to each other and also submitted to a low frequency sound will almost act like, like one, while if you go here, you have high frequency and a large inter uh, hair distance, then the hairs are basically working independently. And yeah, that's, that's another way to represent it. And um, uh, the points are measurements, and the line is our analytical model. And I'm, as a biologist, I'm never used to such good fits. Usually, I'm pretty, that's pretty good. And we can therefore calculate this viscous coupling coefficient. Now, what does it mean for the real animal? We saw that viscous coupling gets smaller at high frequency. It means that at first we have these hairs, which are working broadband, but also working together. So that filters out the high frequency. And by, while keeping the, the, the hairs each at their own natural frequency. Of course, we may wonder why the high frequency need to be filtered out. That's why I, I was asking before. And the, the explanation will come from this here, is that we had to go into the field and look who is eating these crickets. Many different kind of predators, flying, animals or spiders. Of course, a flying animal uh, like maybe like a dipole and therefore produce a sinusoidal wave and this is maybe why we used oscillatory flow. Uh, we had no clue what a spider produced as an airflow. This was never studied by anyone. A lot of work studied on moving animals in the back of the animal because of energy consumption and aerodynamics, but no energy at the front of an animal, uh, no, no study on, on the airflow at the front of an animal. Now, in the field around Tour and in Europe, you have these spiders. They don't produce webs. They run on the floor. Wolf spiders, they are called. Pretty scary animals if you look close enough. A lot of spines. These are not hairs. These are spines. As, as we heard, getting an, anim getting an insect is, is pretty difficult. It's like, like a soap in, 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 your, um, in your bath. You it, it just jump away, and many predators almost get the prey, and the prey is, is too slippery, and, and they will escape. So you need either hard materials in, in your spines, or you need a lot of spines to get into the animal. Uh, no time for this. We saw, by looking at behavior, we saw that spiders have two preferred velocities. Either they basically don't move and wait for the cricket to come by, and they jump on it. There's almost no, no pursue uh, and escape or they like to run at pretty high speed, like, like 30 centimeters per second. And they dislike this region, obviously. Now, we built a piston which was mimicking the acceleration and the velocity of the spider, just to be more reproducible. And we fire that piston to the cricket as many, as many times as we want to have something easier to use uh, than a spider. And this is the cricket escape success. So we see that it peaks around the 20 to 30, this region, which is exactly the one spiders don't like to move into. But it will not escape a piston which moves very fast, uh, very slowly, or very fast. 
The reason here is that uh, the piston is not being recognized as an approaching object. Basically, the hairs don't move or, mo or hardly move. It, it does not have the right signature. The cricket just stay there and, and is hit at the end. Here, the cricket is well aware that something very dangerous is coming, but uh, it's, it's being overrun by, by the piston or by the spider. It's a question of, of speed. Now, what kind of airflow does a running spider produce? Uh, this we had to look into with, with PIV again, and we made measurements. And what you see is um, pockets. Actually, you see airflow upstream, of course. But you see also very strong pockets of air, air, transient airflow of high velocity. This is because, uh, that's a bit odd, awkward uh, as a way to put it, but legs have to go twice as fast as the body to, in order to, uh, for an, an animal to, to move, right? So the, the appendages have to move quicker than the main body. And it, it's, it's producing very quick transient phenomena, which the cricket will also perceive. Now, if you produce this plot, which is distance from the spider body, so it's five millimeters, and you look at the velocity of the airflow, you have this kind of diminishing curve, on which you can then overlay the cricket perception, which is excellent, as, as we heard. And you see, basically, that it's somewhere there. So it means, in fact, that the cricket uh, can perceive a running spider five centimeters before the spider runs into the cricket, even at that high speed. This is due to to this basically excellent uh, uh, threshold. So in order to simplify things, we had a student who worked on, um, or several actually, on, um, on modeling uh, spiders as, as spheres. I don't know if you know that book, which is called Consider a Sphere Spherical Cow. Maybe you know that book. Now it's Consider a Spherical Spider. Um, Using finite elements, we got finally a good model with, um, if you use only the body as a sphere, you get this curve, the red curve, this is the measuring points. Um, the ground effect is very important. Of course, spiders are really near the ground, so there is a lot of air which is pushed forward due to the ground effect. And uh, we, we, need, we need also the legs for the best fit. And then we, we could uh, simulate how far the spider can be felt by the cricket. <clears throat> what does it mean for the cricket? Uh, this is, so we could move the spider toward the cricket, but it is easier for my purpose to move the cricket toward the spider. It does not change anything. And this is the distance from the spider head. Uh, so we are far coming to this here. This is the plot we saw before. And this picture here will show you the um, velocity of the airflow felt by the cricket. I will run it twice because it's a bit complex. So th this will move toward here, this will move there, and this plot will be filled. You had almost probably no time to see this because too, too many things at once, but um, this moved really only at the very end. So I, I, I replay it once more so you can focus now on this. You, you understood that it would this way. You see, no, almost no signal, uh, whoops, shooting up at the end. Now that region is basically almost, uh, the, the cricket is almost in the arms of the spider. It's basically too late, or these are different uh, uh, mechanical problems. But this is the region where the, the cricket can listen to the spider and escape properly. Now, the same plot shows that the high frequency component the, in the energy increases over time. So the nearer the spider of the cricket, the higher the percentage of energy in the high frequency domain. And that has major consequences. So if we sum up this, the high frequency will increase and that leads to a very specific time frequency signature. The cricket listen like music, something is coming and has a very specific signature in time frequency. Nothing like you would listen from the wind, uh, twigs falling on the floor, other animals doing things. This is very typical of something which is coming fast to me and I should jump. We heard that the high frequency also has this uh, interesting effect 
of diminishing the viscous coupling among hairs so that hairs start to work independently over the time course of the attack. And that implies that the small hairs, which are lost in the boundary layer, will be slowly out of the boundary layer because the frequency is getting higher and higher. So what you really have is a specific sequence of recruitment of hairs of different lengths. And this is this recruitment which will uh, enable the cricket to understand there is a danger, I should jump. Jumping does not cost much energy compared to saving your life. There is no, no, no trade-off there. You just jump once more. Okay, so natural enemies are the main reason why we have such a delicate structure. And cockroaches, which is basically the ancestor of crickets. I hope there is not too many entomologists. I'm really doing black and white painting here. Um, uh, they are very old animals, and the re that's, that's very much the reason why you cannot get those cockroaches in your, bath, in your bath, if you have any sometimes, or your kitchen. They will feel your hand or your, your uh, whatever you use to, to catch them. They will feel it very quickly, and they do this since millions of years. Okay, enough for biology. Let's go now to the MEMS. So, sticking tiny items was, was very much en vogue since a long time. Um, it's pre-MEMS pre area almost. Uh, maybe, no, no, this is not really MEMS. This is MEMS. Uh, none of them was actually working. This was the time where just producing a complex MEMS was sufficient to publish a paper, but you did not need to have it working. Um, this, this is over now, but um, uh, this one is working. Uh, this is the way the group of 20 built that MEMS like almost seven years ago, so in the meantime this has changed. Um, one, two, there's five different uh, materials. What they tell me, because this is really th their science, is that they, they could go up to eight materials at most. And then things become impossible. You have gluing problems, interfacing problems. The, uh, the wafer will start to, to not behave properly. Uh, this is, it seems, already a, a rather complex uh, device, this one. So that's the way it works. The hair itself will not bend, it, even though it's a SU8, so it's pretty near in terms of um, density from cuticle, but it's, it's, it does not bend. It's a uh, capacitance measurement, and it sits on the plate, and the capacitor will, uh, will measure the difference. Uh, as I said, they built many different ones. This one is the last generation they did. Uh, many layers gluing, and uh, that's what they finally got. Uh, this picture you saw. And interfacing. I will come back to the interfacing at the end. So they are truly functioning MEMS. Uh, you can build them in series, meaning you can produce MEMS of different sizes on the same wafer. It's not too easy, but it's feasible. And uh, interestingly, they tried to glue MEMS like this. Um, doesn't look good, so you do um, nice pictures like that. But the, the real, real stuff is this one. Uh, you get an increased performance 10 times because an airflow which comes transversal has more impact on a hair than the airflow which comes uh, longitudinal wise. And this is maybe why animals tend to put sensors, uh, flow sensors uh, in the, on the appendages, is because very often the air will hit the hair in a better fashion than putting in on the thorax, for example, which could be looking like, like a plate. Um, and why do we want to do this? Is because we want to have a flow camera at the end. So it will be, these ones are, each one is being individually addressed. So you can really measure the flow at every single point. And what we want to have a 3D measurement on a tiny devices. Now the question, did we succeed? It's very difficult to tell, frankly. I mean, we have a functioning MEMS. So in that sense, we, it's small. It's working more or less using the same physical principle as biology for the mechanical part. I didn't talk much about the neural and the um, signal part. And we thought we could use something engineers use a lot, which is the figure of merit. Surprise, surprise, when I did um, Web of Science two weeks ago, 
figure of merit slash biomimetic slash bionics slash so and so, uh, 10 papers. So the biomimetic scene seems to dislike figure of merit. Maybe there is a good reason for it, even though we, we like it, because it, it implies that you know what you do, uh, figure of merit. You have to really tell what kind of variable you use, how do you measure them on the biological counterpart and the uh, device. Um, the functional relationship in the figure of merit, which is not that simple. And when should you stop as an engineer? When, when are you happy in a biomimetic device? If you don't use something like this, you are very happy with great pictures. And this is why we see in biomimetics too many great pictures. Uh, I think it does not apply to all groups, but there is plenty, plenty of good pictures in the biomimetic scene with very little uh, quantitative assessment of how good they were at the end. So we tried several criteria, responsivity, which is almost like sensitivity, power transfer, we have a lot of discussion right now how to think about this. Response time, quick, to be quick. Uh, ask a lot of questions about uh, should I be uh, um, underdamped or overdamped or critically damped. It very much depends on the kind of signals I'm tracing. And then the detection threshold, which is a signal to noise ratio. Now, this is what we produced last week. So we, you have these different metrics. You have the cricket and you have the MEMS. And then there is this uh, lead factor is how much times the cricket is better than the MEMS. And you see responsivity 200 times, power transfer. We are very bad with the technology. We need still a lot more energy to fire the MEMS than the crickets. We have rather good response time. Um, signal to noise ratio is, is OK. And then the figure of merit depends so much on how you combine these different criteria that it's, uh, um, it's yet not quite stable. So. Uh, did we succeed? I don't know. If I, I pick up the response time, yes, we did. If I pick up the power transfer, it's awful. So it very much depends what biology does once more. And I would like now to make you listening to... We came across something we were not designing, uh, but very surprising, is that it's a very good microphone. Now, what you listen now is to... Is, um, is a recording. Well, I don't know if I can kill it. But it won't last too long. Still too long, huh? So now, with a single hair, is what we, what we heard. So it's not too bad. The signal ratio is way worse than the original, but still, uh, this was not intended at all. What we were doing was to build a MEM sensor for um, near field flow sensing and not hearing. Uh, uh, and we don't understand because we have uh, done a lot of neurobiology in the cricket. I have no time to show you this, but the cricket also listened to the planes using these hairs. And it has ears. So it's not that the ears of the cricket would be the hairs. It has its own ears as well. So, but, so yes, we succeeded. We did even more than intended. That's another way to put it. Depends. Um, Plenty of room for improvement. In particular, in the signal, um, in the signal um, analysis part, we have, uh, in the meantime, very good engineers which uh, use uh, stochastic resonance and, and the like to, to improve the uh, signal processing part, which is also implemented in biology, by the way, or reverse. Uh, let me almost finish by making a list of why it is so important for bionics to have biologists around I could not say around you, but around groups. And actually, uh, one of the major failure in the US, which I actually know better for the biomimetic scene uh, in terms of bionics, was the DARPA project funded on, uh, on spider silk. 
huge, huge failure. Why? Because an engineer could have the tendency, not all do this, obviously, but to just look and then jump to the engineer world and not pay enough attention to the biologist side. You, you not only need this interface, but you also need at first to really understand biology quite a bit before you jump to the more technical implementation. And the engineers on the silk of spiders uh, thought they could produce silk in milk. You have seen this, the, the cow which tried to produce milk. They had not seen that spiders produce milk through six different um, pores or um, organs and and silk is also a structural material which is which is being netted together while it's being extruded and you cannot understand uh, silk of spiders if you don't have these different um, outlet through which the different compounds come out if you want to have uh, um, a cow it will not produce uh, spider silk just because it's uh, it's not not designed to in the first place uh, so uh, Biology is full of tricks, but you need to find the good one. That's so you need biologists to know. Uh, even the lotus effect was still uh, not invented, but found out by someone who spent his life looking at plant or uh, structure in, in a museum. Uh, that's, that's, that's him. Uh, without this knowledge, he would never have seen it, and pe other people would have taken on. Um, this is um, functional morphology of uh, the old, so-called old school functional morphology. Uh, we need ecologists to think in terms of evolutionary forces. Um, yeah, this I had almost no time to explain, but I, uh, sometimes I go to conferences where people try to make uh, flapping flight uh, vehicles. And then the, the engineers split the group and say, you will do the battery, you do the aerodynamics, you do the computing in the brain, and so on. And biology does not work like this. It does all at once, uh, highly integrated. So you don't use a sensor and you put it on your structure. The sensor is built in the structure while the structure is being built. And it's really at, at once. Um, many sensors, few computation. That's, that's why insects have so many hairs. We don't know today if it's redundancy, if it's uh, every single hair is a bit different and therefore you have a very fine-tuned uh, understanding of the scene. This we don't know. And uh, this is more um, insect-based distributed computing. Insects have several brains. They don't need to shoot everything in the CPU. They can um, work at the periphery, what needs to be worked at the periphery. You don't block the main CPU in order to compute something which the leg can compute on its own. And that's a very interesting uh, um, aspect. So, yeah, biomimetics is uh, a two-way process, back and forth. Of course, as biologists, I'm very much interested in this. I understood my beast way better by building these tiny devices at the end. And uh, I end up by thinking uh, the EU, which was uh, instrumental in uh, putting together large groups, 20, uh, some of you may know Georges Rodimidis, who is here, material scientist uh, from England, and others. Um, on the base of our cricket hairs, the uh, IST group asked me to build another consortium uh, on, um, well, we have tiny, tiny hairs also in the ear, right? And fishes have similar story. Bats have also similar story. It seems that... Uh, uh, Inverted pendulum is a great invention in nature all over the place. And uh, the point of that consortium was to find analogies between different animals and, and technologies as well. Thank you.